Hello everyone. In this episode of Versus, I'm going to be looking at the P-72 Archimedes and the P-52 Merlin. It isn't often that I get the chance to compare two ships that come from the same manufacturer, and these two vessels are more similar than any other that I've compared up until now. Both ships are developed by Kruger Intergalactic, and at this time Kruger has a rather light lineup when it comes to the amount of manufactured ships that it's responsible for developing, and so far their entire roster consists of only these two vessels. Both of them are considered to be parasite ships, meaning that they're purpose-built to only be able to dock with a specific kind of ship. So they're not going to be able to dock with space stations or any other vessels even if they have a docking collar. It also means that they're going to be heavily reliant on the mother's ship, which is going to act as their main base of operation. The snub fighter is going to have a limited range, and has no inherent ability to quantum travel or use jump gates. So it's going to have to also rely on the mother's ship in order for it to be able to jump to a new location. Specifically, the Merlin and the Archimedes are designed to be compatible with several ships that fall within the Constellation lineup. If you venture into the stern of any of those vessels, you'll find a specialized room that's been converted into a unique type of hangar. This custom-built hangar allows a snubcraft to be able to dock with it from along the underside of the ship, so that when it's docked, the cockpit projects up through the floor of the room. This is more of a direct connection than you'd find when using a traditional docking collar. There's also a lot more of a stable connection, which allows the two ships to remain linked when going into Quantum. The collar on the back of the Constellation is designed specifically for the Merlin and the Archimedes, so it's not a true docking collar, and is only going to be compatible with these two ships. In the future, other collar options may be made available for this ship, but nothing's definite at this time. It's also entirely possible that other ships could be released by Kruger that have this same kind of style cockpit, could also be used to dock with Akani in the same way that the snub fighters do. This setup helps to minimize the amount of deck space that the smaller craft occupies, and allows the pilot to be able to access the snub fighter from within the safety of the larger vessel. Storing a ship internally, even one as small as something like the Merlin, can take up a lot more room than most people would expect. An internal space is a precious commodity for any ship, which could otherwise be used for any number of other functions. The Merlin is the snub fighter that comes stock with both the Andromeda and the Aquila. It can be easily identified by its gray veneer that reflects a shining silver light off of its contours. Its interior trim and seat is considered to be a bit no frills when compared to something like the Archimedes, but I really don't see any differences here, other than the lack of a distinguishing color palette or the absence of any ostentatious looking paneling or trim work. My philosophy on this is, as long as the seat fits your butt, then who really cares what it looks like? The interior console display is the exact same as the one that you'd find in its sister craft. They both have uniquely rounded corners and a series of displays that are rather large in relation to the size of the dashboard. For weapons, it has two size 1 hardpoints on the wings that come armed with laser repeaters. And it has a single size 2 Tiger Strike Ballistic Gatling gun that's mounted onto and recessed into the nose of the ship. Being built into the design of the ship in this way means that, as a result for the time being, this gun cannot be removed or replaced with another weapon. There will be tuning options for the Tiger Strike and different forms of ammunition that it can be loaded with, but it's unlikely that they're going to allow anything else to be mounted onto the size 2 hardpoint. All of these weapons that it's armed with have the same range, and as a result all their pips line up together forming a single targeting point. The Merlin will get refueled and its ballistic weapons reloaded when it docks with the Connie. That is, as long as you have the spare bullets and fuel to load it up with. Its top speed is 1028. It brakes fast and has a fast acceleration rate, but tends to overheat halfway through if you're trying to stop while going full burn. For components, it has a single small radar, one small power plant, two small coolers, a small shield generator, and one small fuel tank. The Merlin does not have a fuel scoop, jump engines, or a quantum drive, so it's going to have to be fairly tethered to the main craft when it comes to the distances that it can travel. Even though the Merlin doesn't have a quantum drive, it's still capable of landing on the surface of a planet, as well as being able to break Atmo on its own and traveling back into space. 
The Merlin's aerodynamically designed chassis allows it to hold its own fairly well when traveling through an atmosphere. The ship doesn't have any cargo space or internal storage, which is going to be one of the trade-offs you're going to have to contend with when dealing with a ship of its size. The Merlin may happen to be considered as the lower end of the two models, but it still has a lot of room to grow. It doesn't come in a maxed out state, and it can be outfitted with different components and weapons that allows it to adhere to a number of different playstyles. This is going to include the engines, which among other things could be upgraded to full racing specs, putting it on the same competitive level as the Archimedes. That is, of course, assuming that you're willing to put the time and money into doing so. You could also outfit it with stealth components, and replace that shiny silver paint job with a matte black one. This could transform it into becoming quite an efficient stealth ship, because if you added stealth components onto its already small signature, then you could get in extremely close to something that's sitting on the edge of your scanner range without being detected, so that you could get a better look at what it is that's out there and find out what kind of threat it may pose to you. The Archimedes is considered to be more of a high-end version of these two ships. It's also the accompanying vessel that comes bundled with a Constellation Phoenix. The P-72 has a matching white paint job that has a high-gloss finish to it. The tips of its wings are swept up to give it that extra sense of speed even when standing still. And it comes with a fancier-looking interior than the Merlin has, which consists of a wood panel trim, stitched leather padding, and a bit more variation to its internal color scheme. The large semi-wraparound console displays exactly the same as the dashboard that appears in the Merlin. The Archimedes has four size 1 weapon mounts that are all located on the wings and comes armed with four laser auto guns. For components, the Archimedes has a single small radar, one small power plant, two small coolers, a small shield generator, and one small fuel tank. It also has a fuel scoop. I've already tested this out and it is currently functioning in-game. This is particularly important since a number of smaller ships have already had their fuel scoop capabilities removed, so it's good to see that the Archimedes was not one of them. Its top speed is 1,340. It accelerates at a much quicker pace than the Merlin, and it can go full burn to a complete stop without overheating the engines in the process. As stated as part of the original design doc for this ship, it was meant to double as a competition racer. The Archimedes was initially targeted to fit somewhere between the M50 and the Mustang Omega in terms of its overall performance, but this aspect of the ship is still under development and is subject to change. This chassis is an almost complete copy of the Merlin's minus some of the cosmetic changes that have been done to the wings, the placement of the ship's mounts, and a few other superficial alterations. But its weight distribution and overall aerodynamic design is exactly the same, and as such it handles just as well when traveling within an atmosphere. And like the Merlin, it's perfectly capable of landing on a planet, traveling back into space under its own power. All this ship really needs is the ability to have some kind of aftermarket quantum drive installed onto it, and this would end up being the perfect small transport. The Archimedes gives the owner full control over how they want to customize its weapon's loadout, since all of its guns can be removed and replaced with any other kind of size 1 weapon. However, the Merlin forces you to stick with using its size 2 Gatling gun, which isn't much of a problem if you like that weapon. But for anyone who wants to have a bit more versatility, or choose another size 2 gun, it could end up being a bit of an issue. Also, having four size 1 weapons puts out a slightly higher DPS than having two size 1s and a size 2. So with regards to customization and damage output, the Archimedes has the advantage. These vessels have the same number of components as each other, but the Merlins are all civilian class, while the Archimedes mainly has either competition or military grade components. The Archimedes also has a fuel scoop, which the Merlin does not come with. So although this is not going to provide this ship with full autonomy, it is going to help to extend out its range. 
As it stands, these two parasite fighters are the smallest flyable ships in the game. This gives them a lot of leeway when it comes to being carried around by other vessels. For instance, these two ships can easily fit inside the vehicle bay of the Valkyrie. Not at the same time, mind you, but you know what I'm saying. You can pull it right in, land, and take off again without a hitch. Much to my surprise, I also managed to get both the Merlin and the Archimedes inside of a Freelancer Max, with very little difficulty involved. It looked like it was going to be touch and go all the way until I finally got it inside of the ship's rear cargo bay. But it fits without issues, and I didn't have to do anything weird or special in order to work the bulk of the ship around the rear turret struts. And once I landed, I had plenty of room to get out of it and into the cabin of the ship. And yet another surprise was the Caterpillar. During one experiment, we managed to get a Merlin into each of the Caterpillar's cargo bays. You have to be careful, and it does take a gentle touch to get it in safely, but the skill level that's involved in doing this is minimal, and easy to master with a sliced amount of practice. You have to get the snubs as far in as you can before parking the ship, but if you do it right, you'll still be able to shut the hangar doors and be able to quantum travel with these ships inside. There are a lot of other vessels you can technically get a Merlin or Archimedes into. Like for instance a 600i, that is if you're careful and you want to invest the time that it takes to get it in. And once you do, as you can see from here, it can end up being a bit problematic to try and get it out again. You can also get a bunch of Merlins and or Archimedes into a Starfarer, but it takes a steady hand and some careful finagling to work its landing gear around the lip of the entrance. And the last time we tried getting a bunch in at once, the accident to success rate was kind of iffy. Bottom line is, it's fun to try, but it isn't the most reliable way of carting a snub fighter around. So why would somebody choose a Merlin over an Archimedes? Or an Archimedes over a Merlin? The Archimedes' ability to maneuver feels like it's on par with the Merlin, but it has a noticeably faster acceleration rate and braking speed. It also has better components, a fuel scoop, a lot faster top speed, it's aesthetically a little easier on the eyes, and its weapons have a slightly higher DPS. While the Merlin is being dubbed as a better choice for providing short-term combat support, this is because it comes equipped with civilian class components, which are going to wear out at a lot slower rate than the Archimedes competition class components will. This also means that the Merlin is going to require a lot less maintenance, so it's going to be able to operate for a lot longer without having system shutdowns, misfires, or component failures, which in turn is going to equate to a lot higher level of dependability. The Merlin's single size 2 gun may provide slightly less DPS than what two size 1 weapons would produce, but that single size 2 gun in comparison is going to have better aim, a longer range, wear down at a slower rate, cost less to replace, and present less of a strain on the coolers. So in the end, the Merlin is designed to be a bit more rugged and maintenance-free, while the Archimedes is more built around immediate gratification. It performs on a lot higher level, but it's going to require a lot of extra attention to keep it running. There's one last issue that I'd like to address concerning these ships, and it's all about the overall effectiveness of the Parasite Fighter, which has really started to be scrutinized, especially seeming how neither one of them have quantum capabilities. That alone is going to limit the number of things that you can use them for, and they have only a single seat. So unlike with other snub fighters like the 85X, they can't be used to taxi a passenger to or from the Constellation. The lack of a quantum drive also is going to greatly hinder its ability to be used as a scout, seeming how it can't jump ahead of the craft and check out locations ahead of time, or even jump between the QT points that are found around a moon or a planet. Lastly, its combat prowess seems to be a bit underwhelming especially when measured up against the Constellation's four size 5 gun mounts and its one or more turrets, which should provide ample enough protection against attackers already. So why would you also send out a ship that has a limited ability to attack or defend itself, and could possibly be left behind with no way of catching back up to the mother craft if it had to make a hasty retreat? All of these are valid points and things to consider before launching these vessels. So if that's the case, then what good are they? First, I never considered these two ships to be substandard fighters, but I instead view them as being the most advanced form of an EVA suit that you could ever be wearing. In that respect, you gain a nearly unlimited supply of oxygen to work with, far superior weapons to anything that you could possibly carry by hand, It offers a huge upgrade to your maneuvering abilities and to the speed that you can travel at. 
and it bestows upon you a shield and the entire hull of the ship to act as protection, which could soak up a lot more damage than your own personal armor could end up protecting you from. It also gains the ability to scan targets, manage its power and heat, and gives you access to a comms channel. It presents a way for you to quickly travel out to some location and scrutinize it in more detail. Think of wrecks and densely packed asteroid belts that have lots of tiny shards of debris that a large ship like the Kani would have to otherwise duck and weave its way through, when instead it could use its snub fighter to go in and inspect the area to see if it's actually worth investigating any further. There are lots of scenarios that are still pending with regards to the universe as it continues to be flushed out. For instance, imagine a type of odd fungus that exists within the boundaries of space, which during the course of your adventures could find its way onto the outer hull of your ship. Over time it would start to expand, and if left unchecked would continue to grow and eventually would start to develop large green pustules that would start to leach energy from the life support system, putting a massive strain on them. The only way to correct this problem would be to use the parasite craft to shoot any of these pustules off, which once destroyed would return the ship to its normal operating status. Or for that matter, it could be some kind of energy leaching parasites like the Minox from Star Wars. And if you picked one of these up, then you'd have to search out the outer hull of the ship to find them, and use the snubcraft to shoot them off. In still yet another scenario, I envision coming across the derelict husk of a reclaimer floating amongst a small pocket of asteroids. Its drones had long since gone haywire, and now start to try and dismantle any ship that comes within proximity of its scanners. The signature from the Connie would definitely set it off, but something small like a Merlin could sneak in undetected and shoot him down, or get in close enough to sneak aboard the Reclaimer so that they could take its remaining systems offline, rendering it safe for the main vessel to approach. Also going back to the example of the Krakapillar, just one Merlin or Archimedes isn't anything to be afraid of, but a swarm of them is an entirely different story. If a group of parasite fighters all concentrated their fire on a single enemy, the results can be devastating. Both the Archimedes and the Merlin are so small that their cross-section makes a buccaneer look big in comparison, and the signature that they give off is so minimal that any supporting enemy craft would have a tough time detecting or getting a missile lock on them. So there's a lot of room for snub fighters to begin to shine as the game expands and new systems come online, allowing them to finally earn their rightful place within the Star Citizen pantheon of ships. I've been your host, Law of the West. Thanks for watching, and take care.